At one point, he tried to go for his gun, and I made the mistake of grabbing his arms, and the gun went off. At three o'clock in the morning, I'm standing next to a public defender who tells me that I'm facing life imprisonment for these charges. That's it. I watched 11 people commit suicide. Speak, and you get your ass whooped. One year, five years, seven years, nine years, it's all gone by, and then the evidence gets lost, and then she leaves me, and I'm wondering what to do. So, How does it fail? to be given the death sentence. Close your eyes for a minute. So today we are joined by Nick Yarris, former death row inmate, probably one of the most, wow, I don't even know how to start this, but how are you, Nick? I'm doing well, Ads, and it's a real honor to come here. It's amazing how this all lines up. We weren't even supposed to speak today in so many ways, but yet just in the last, 24 hours, it proves that things can line up in life, can't they? 100%, mate, 100%. I mean, I've did a, a five-hour drive to make this happen, but that's nothing compared to what you've had to go through, mate. And straight away, I want to jump into it because obviously you've you've did, your life has been, I mean, I, I, said to, I said to my friend on the way down here that not many people in this world will get to have a conversation with someone like yourself who sat on death row. Uh, how long did you, were you in for 22 years? 22 years on death row, 23 in total. 23 years in prison and 22 on death row. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your childhood um, and what led you to that position. The sad thing is where I grew up in Philadelphia, it was going through a metamorphosis at the time that I was a child. When I first uh, recognized any of the beautiful memories that I could feel it always seemed to be music related. Do you know what I mean? Like your childhood. Yeah. And I can always remember the sound of Philadelphia with Teddy Pendergrass and the OJs and Patti LaBelle playing on the radio. And, and the next thing I know, I'm a little boy who's gone through the trauma of having been attacked and raped by a man in my neighborhood who beat my head in with a rock and left me with aphasia. And that onset of the damage done to me just left my life in ruins can you imagine what it would be like to be so young and have to hold that secret in and not be able to seek help i didn't mentally have the capabilities to deal with the many facets of how damaging this all was i just started becoming resentful because i became left-handed after the incident where I was dominantly a right-handed person after the incident, I was throwing and everything was left-handed. And I had to wear spectacles and I was very upset that I couldn't see and they moved me to the front of the class and I started fights all the time and I didn't like myself. And I was always that kid who was acting up because I had turmoil. Yeah, Something inside me was driving me mad. Mm -hmm. So that's the onset of my life that set me onto a bad path. Did you speak to anyone at that time when those things were going on? I never told anyone what happened until I was 24 years old. Is there any reason, or did you feel like you wanted to keep that to yourself because it's something that you'd been through and you want to deal with it as a man? No. At the time that I told anyone, I sat my parents down on a prison visit while I was on death row and I explained to them what happened to me when I was a boy. My appeals were in ruins. I expected to be executed. I figured it was time to tell them. My mother's reaction was, oh, thank God. Oh, thank God we thought we were bad parents. We thought we were to blame for the way that you behaved. Yeah. We we blamed ourselves for you, Nikki. It's not mad. It's not mad. I man. never knew that. Yeah, of course. My secret made my parents suffer because they're like, why does he do this? It yeah. must be us. We're letting him down some way. At least, I suppose, to a certain degree, how horrible it does sound, it, it give them peace because the, there was a reason why you acted out like that. Yeah, because she was carrying such a guilt-laden burden of thinking she was a failure as a mother. I how was your relationship with your mother and father? I had a brilliant relationship with my mother and father. My father just died last week. Yeah, sorry about that. And um, he had a wicked sense of humor. He was a very clever, funny person who could 
gain perspective on life by making a joke. Yeah. 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 He wasn't well educated, but he was, he was a very clever person. My mother, God bless her, couldn't get a joke to save her life. <laughs> but she was as sweet as a mint. You know what I mean? Any brothers or sisters? Three sisters still alive, and both my brothers are now dead. I mean, is that related? Just health? My brother died of a drug overdose in my parents' house when I was on death row at the age of 39, my baby brother, Marty. And then my brother Mikey died of a consumption and a seizure-related heart attack in 2010 when you got sentenced to death row now i know obviously a lot of people who are tuned in they'll have heard stories about people getting sentenced to life in prison um whatever reason that they tune into crime it's it's a popular thing but not everyone that they listen to will have will have served on death row um what led you to get to getting that kind of sentence so becoming an addict of many forms of drugs and alcohol, I became a car thief. At the age of 19, well into my uh, obliterated state of being a drug addict, I stole a car and I got arrested for it. But the officer who pulled me over for that car stop became aggressive and started hitting me and fighting with me, and I resisted. At one point, he tried to go for his gun and I made the mistake of grabbing his arms and the gun went off. Right. So that's what changed my whole life. That moment. He decided to change the story immediately. After he gained control of me, he put me in the back of the car. He jumped into the front seat and composed himself and thought about this for a long moment. And then I watched him take the microphone off the dash of his radio and began reporting this incident as if it was right now happening. Help me, help me, officer under attack, shots fired. Fucking hell. I'm watching the look on his face. Are you, when what he are finished. you doing at this point? I'm looking in the back seat. like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, I was so confused by it all. I watched in a detached manner of why he was doing it. Then he looked at me in the rear view mirror and he sneered at me. And then he jumped out and waited for the rescuing officers to arrive. When they got there, they immediately got around him and like, are you okay? And he's like, that bastard tried to murder me. I pulled over behind him and he ran up to my car and he punched me in the face and took my gun. What can I do? Yeah. So then I got the gun back off him. I should have killed him and all that. I'm like listening to this. I'm like, no, no. But I couldn't say anything. I'm a 20-year-old junkie, man. When the gun went off, was anyone injured? No. No, it just a shot was fired. Right. Yeah, okay. And mm -hmm. he realized that was all kind of bad paperwork. So why not make up a story? And I made him angry. He couldn't overpower me. I was too strong. And it really made him angry. So at three o'clock in the morning, I'm standing next to a public defender who tells me that I'm facing life imprisonment for these charges. That's it. I'm like, but I stole a car just to get some money and get high. He's like, no, this guy said you tried to murder him and you were kidnapping him when he took his gun off of you and they're charging you with the attempted murder of an officer. I was like, no, man. What? I was trying to actually say the words like, no, like it meant something. He yeah. said, so they threw me in prison and I went through detox and I lost it. I was so depressed and out of it that I sadly had a newspaper in my cell and it was a, a feature story about a murder in the area and it was a whodunit. And I kept thinking, if I made up a lie, I bet I could supersede the lie that put me on death row. Man, stupid. So the police initially believed me and they talked to the officer and the officer that arrested me agreed to reduce the charges against me to just nothing more than resisting arrest mm -hmm. that I would be taken to Philadelphia for the stolen car, right? Yeah, of course. Basically nothing. They believed me on the story that I made up that I knew the guy that did the murder in the newspaper and I could help them solve the case and they were all over me, promised me everything. It came back in three days. And they said that they found out I was lying. And instead of telling me that how much trouble I was in for making up the story, and like I told them, look, okay, 
Well, at least you know I made up my lie because that officer lied about me. And he already said he was going to take the charges back. Why would he do that if I did it? I yeah, was yeah. rationally yeah, arguing with him. Yeah. Say, see, it proves me innocent. I didn't do it if he's willing to take the charges back. They're like, no, no. What conversation? So I knew I was done. Fucking hell, Matt. I know, but it gets worse. So they take me down and they interrogate me all day long. Then they bring me back. And right in front of this gang members from the Pagan's motorcycle gang, they ha un handcuffed me in the holding cells under the jail. And they give me a big hug and tell me, thanks for the information. They're going to go kick doors in now. I'm like, what are you doing, man? Like, I literally I was pulling, they was stepping back. I was like pulling at them. Like, what are you saying? These dudes are standing right there. And they're like, you fucking rat. You're done. I'm fucking hell, Matt. I know. So the next morning, they start attacking me. Guy tries to put my eye out. They throw bleach and urine in my face. They try and get me all day. I have to hold my mattress up for hours. Then as soon as they open my door, I just came out and just, rip. oh, man, anybody out there got it. Was when that time when the officers effectively fitted you up, was that a common thing or were you a rare case? I, I was being accused of a homicide in their eyes and they weren't getting any answers. They were going to break me, put pressure on me. After six days of being tortured by these gangs and everybody on the block thinking I'm an informant, I hung myself. Yeah. A guard cut me down and said that I wasn't allowed to cheat the state of Pennsylvania out of its punishment Fucking of me. So while I was in the hospital, my mom came and visited me while I was in restraints. And she begged me to do one thing. Whatever you got to go through, I can't understand. But please don't kill yourself. Come back to me. Come home to me. Yeah. Make yourself something worthy. Come back to me. Dudes are going by, getting their medication. They're being horrible, grabbing their Johns and stuff in front of my mom. So I said, okay, fine. I'll go back and I'll fight. They put an inmate in the cell next to me named Charles Michael Catalino. He had been convicted of burglarizing the prosecutor's home. He was convicted of a jury of this already when they came to him and said, we need a favor. We're going to put you in a cell next to Nick Yaris, and you're going to con say he confessed to you. Deal? He's like, yep. It's all in paperwork now. Yeah. After later on, we found all these secret deals they did. They were giving him sex visits, letting him score drugs on the visit. In the district attorney's office, he was having sex with his girlfriend. Fucking hell, Matt. They you needed don't realize this. Like this was a big case, and they needed it solved. Mm -hmm. So they needed, like this was a whodunit, you know, so... They decided to throw me under the bus, man. Do you think, did they genuinely not know who did that? And they decided just put me under the bus. So it wasn't a case, it was a case of we can't be asked to find this man. We're just going to put you in there. In it the was so it's important easier. that they got this case closed because women can't go to the mall, go shopping and get abducted and raped and murdered. That can't go on. 1981. So they went after me hard and they made up a crazy story that I did all this because I broke up with my 19-year-old girlfriend. So they accused you of abducting, raping, and murdering a girl? Not just that. They accused me of being psychologically twisted and going out and fixating on a stranger and then stalking her and then murdering her after raping her. Oh, yeah, they made me out to be crazy so that anything could be done to me. Yeah, now I went from the guys leaving me alone for being an informant to thinking I'm a sicko who butchered this woman because I'm fixated and mental, and now the attacks start again. Had you been given the life sent the death row sentence at this point? No. No. I was just arrested. I hadn't even been on trial on the original charges with the police officer yet. So the whole death row thing wasn't even no. in your mind. It was just I'm sitting there at that point facing attempted murder of a police officer and kidnapping, plus Kidnapping, rape, and murder of a woman I never met in my life. <laughs> no, but you I'm know, 20 years old. You know the future's not looking good at that, though, because when the officers are involved, you know that you're fucked anyway, don't you? But the jury saw his lie. Okay. Remember the story. He said, I got out of my car. I rushed back to his car. I punched him in his face and knocked his eyeglass off him. I got his pistol out and I hit him in his face. He was telling the other officers. He took a photograph of his hand to show the jury of the scratch that happened when the gun was taken from his hand, he said. Mm -hmm. My lawyer simply asked him, what's up with photographing your face? Yeah, You get punched in. Obviously, you'd, yeah. And that's when he blew it. Mm -hmm. And the jury looked at him and said, ah, okay. 
The scratch, we believe, because you was fighting, but that boy didn't hit you. And if that boy didn't hit you, he ain't guilty. They found me guilty and not guilty of all charges within 15 minutes. Fucking hell, Matt. Yeah, but that was the downfall, wasn't it? The prosecutor who taught, lost that case was a man named Barry Gross. He was in so incensed by losing that case of a police officer's word against the inmate, slam dunk. Yeah, exactly. That he went mental in the courtroom, threw the files against the wall and threatened me and said, I'll never leave the county alive. He then took over the murder prosecution where he had nothing to do with it in the past and then began seeking a death penalty the very next week. Two months after I was found not guilty by a jury, I was back in that courthouse for trial. I was given a three-day murder trial for capital murder at the age of 21. Fucking hell. Did that, did that instantly make the press and everything? Was that just... Oh, it was huge. Yeah. So did, you, did part of you feel like you were already fucked anyway? Like your identity being stripped? You, your name had been tarnished? You were I, this knew that they, I knew that they were so angry that I was so close to getting out that they were terrified and they would do anything. Yeah, because of the shit you'd have on them effectively if you became then, free. God had a say in it all. You see, there was an incident in the courtroom where they showed where Mrs. Linda May Craig had been found behind a church in the snow. Two boys walking that morning came upon what they thought was a mannequin, and they thought that they would kick the snow away from the mannequin to see if it was a male or a female mannequin, only to discover Mrs. Craig's body. They were standing in blood. They didn't know it. But as they ran away, their footprints arced as they ran in terror. And the photograph that was shown to the jury of where she lay in the snow looked like an angel's wings outline. Yeah, of where they'd run. After they showed that to the jury, a bolt of lightning hit the courthouse and knocked all the power out. They jumped up and started pulling pistols like I'm escaping or something. I can't believe this moment. <sighs> they take me out of the courtroom. They take me upstairs and they put me in a big holding cell overlooking the courtyard outside. And as I stood there, I heard God's voice tell me to look them in the eye. And I did. Like I heard this feeling. It wasn't words. And I knew what I had to do. Because after they showed all that stuff to the jury and they could never look at me, the jury stopped looking at me on the second day of the trial. Yeah, of course. Yeah? The judge couldn't look at me when he was pronouncing me guilty. I was horrified by that. In fact, in the newspapers later on, it's described how I told him he couldn't even look me in the face while he was sentenced me to death. And then I told him to go to hell. But all they put in the newspaper after that was... What you Defiant said. killer tells judge to go to hell. When you're given the life sentence, the death sentence, sorry. Obviously, there's going to be people watching and listening who have their own how they would think, but no one truly knows because they're, not, they're never going to be in that position, hopefully. How does it feel to be given the death sentence? Someone just told you you're absolutely worthless. And that you're sick in the head and they're going to strap you into a chair and electrocute you. I was 21 years old. It felt like I was so embarrassed for my family. I was so humiliated because I didn't do it. I was so angry because no one could look me in the face that I was the only one holding my head up. Did anyone not believe you who was close to you? I don't know. Is it is it a conversation it's, you've ever had? Did you ever did you ever get any feelings, whether it be friends, ex girlfriends, parents? It's strange relatives. You, yeah, but when you come out of the tomb, everyone says they believe you. Yeah, of course they do. So, I didn't ever have anybody ever say to me, "Hey, man, I think you're a piece of shit." But did you? Although you said you felt worthless, you know in your heart that you're innocent. Yeah. So did you have a, was it an anger? Was it a, a bitterness towards the system? Were you like, the world's fucked? Or did you think, and I know this sounds quite morbid, did you think maybe I just deserve to die? I was so angry at first. I didn't have that kind of perspective. 
I was just overwhelmingly angry. And then they did the worst thing to me possible. They put me in a prison where I wasn't allowed to even speak in my cell. So for the next two years, I didn't have any venting. I didn't have any chance to talk to anybody. What do you about. mean you weren't allowed to speak? In my own cell for the first two years. You were yeah. allowed to speak? Speak and you get your ass whooped. Do it again, and they come in with a nurse who's holding a needle full of drugs, and she stabs you with the needle in the ass, and you're out. And is that just procedure on death row? Yeah, it used to be. I wasn't I on death row initially. They didn't yeah, even have yeah. one. They put me in with the punishment units, and then they started torturing me because I'm right next to the guy that killed two wardens. So yeah, of course. I know. They used to torture me all the time. They used to think that I was mentally ill, Mm -hmm. And that I was a mentally ill sexual predator, so they were tormenting me. I wasn't the average prisoner, man. Do yeah, you get course. this? Yeah, yeah, of course. My crime wasn't being a criminal. My crime was being a sexually deviant criminal. So it's like the lowest of the low in that system as child well. Child molesters and me. Kill a child or what I did was the worst too. Yeah, of course. So they haven't just put you in that place. I had a bounty on me. Ads, people were trying to collect $10,000 by killing me too. I've been stabbed multiple times. I've had over, oh my God, the fights. This is why I had the heal because I knew I was becoming too violent. And I didn't know the answer. And this officer took me past the cell of a man that killed himself and gave me some books. That was it. I got lucky. Because you've, you've read over 8,000 books, haven't you? Before I stopped counting, I had a ledger with 9,400 books that I sent to my lawyers. That's phenomenal. I mean, what else can you do in them places? Not only that, but I, I studied psychology. I became the foremost layperson of knowledge about DNA testing. I helped other men get out of prison. I wrote letters to their mothers. I wrote letters to their lawyers. After a while, if anybody had a problem with me, they had to deal with 50 of me. Yeah, I get that. So did you do that to strengthen yourself or did you do that literally as an escape or just to help others? Because how do you find a place in your heart to help others because when you're going through it came turmoil? down to a freeing moment of once I told my parents what happened to me, it happened after I escaped from death row and I turned myself in. Mm -hmm. So I escaped from prison from death row in 1985. At the conclusion of that event, I told my parents what happened. And then I went on this mad journey of reading all of the world's religions, at the end of which I was rewarded with finding out that I would become the very first man in American history from death row to seek DNA testing to prove my innocence. Fucking phenomenal. Like that in itself, Nick, you've changed the world. Yeah, but it took a long battle of 15 years because they were trying to destroy the evidence. They didn't want that to happen. But... And I know that you, you've effectively, and it's awful, you've been the guinea pig in that process. But when you someone 15 years to change the world isn't a long time. Nope. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You have. Think of I all had, the people who I you've know. saved. I had to fight through all of these advancements. And thank God I was pen pals with Sir Alec Jeffries here in Leicestershire, who invented the DNA science to begin with. And he explained to me the advancements that were coming. And I had an, a great deal of help from others in the field. Finally, in 2003, the evidence that remained from the case proved that I was innocent. Two separate DNA results proved that unknown male number one left his sperm and his DNA inside of pair of killer's gloves that were left at the scene, as well as another man's DNA. None of it matches me. Did the man get caught? No. So the man's still out there? I guess because he's either a dead or out there because when I got out, I got a bullhorn and I went to the courthouse and I began fighting for the victim because nobody else was. Have you ever met the victim's family? They hate me. They can't believe I didn't have something to do with it because I was the epitome of evil for them for so long. How could I not been a killer? Yeah. Do you, do you blame them for thinking that way? No. Do you think you'd think the same if it was it was the other way around? Do you no. think if the media portrayed this character inside prison who's such a beast, do you think it would be hard to erase that image from your mind if that's what you've associated with someone? For me personally? Yeah. No. But for many people, yes. 
And I think for and it's you, understandable. Yeah, of course. And I think for you to say, for you personally, no, it's because you went on a on a lifetime journey of forgiveness and understanding and purpose. And it's called hubris. Yeah, the word is hubris. What does it, that mean? It means a driven act of humbly offering yourself every day. To live with hubris is to to recognize your your failings, your faults, your your human. Yeah. Recognizing your humanity in a self genteel manner, and I, I try my best because I've been through so many extremes. You have to understand, it was never easy for me, but it hasn't been meant to be easy for me for a reason, and I figured it out. I couldn't stand or sit before you today and earn the respect from you that I have if I had it easy from day one when I got out of prison. Of course. I had to learn my lesson all over and show people what neuroplasticity healing is all about because I'm just now coming out of living in the woods for three years, losing my wife and children, losing my business, COVID, losing my reputation, everything. I come to this country, I've only been in England two months and I've already reached a hundred million people and it's going to continue. And for those who don't know with neuroplasticity, it's it's effectively understanding, you know, your your flaws and stuff as well and being overly polite and, and understanding how to interact with people and always doing the right thing. I'll give it right to you thing. in the great, the greatest analogy of it is, it's a gymnasium for the brain. I fucking love that. It is, yeah, yeah, because yeah. if I can teach you the tools of, of neuroplasticity, you can practice them to the point that you have this beautiful, charismatic charm. And when you have that, you emanate it. The energy that I give out, I can captivate the room because I believe so much in myself because I've erased my PTSD with utter politeness and meticulous politeness, especially because your brain has a built-in reward system. We're like that gerbil. We'll go over and yeah. get the treat. Because when I am being polite to someone and helping them and being kind, my brain is receiving all of this beautiful, receiving good neuroplasticity healing. I've gotten so good at it. I don't have time throughout my day to be negative. Yeah, of course. I'm on to the next face. I think to get to that point, I want to, I want to, I want to, it's not something I want to focus on. But it's a curiosity of mine personally, and I guarantee it is for for many of the viewers around the world. Facing the hardest time of your life behind bars, 23 years, 22, which you're in, what is it, 23 hours a day, bang up. What types of things do you see that goes on in there? What type of things? Because obviously to have your kind of mental strength now, it's fucking unbelievable, mate. I mean, since you walked in the room, I, I feel a different way just by in your hair. And that's mad. That's mad. Now, what type of things does someone have to go through to, to or have to witness, have to see, to have that kind of mental grit that you've got now? The first time I heard someone kill themselves on the block, I thought it was a plastic mattress being thrown out the cell from the empty cell. I was being tortured in a unit that was so hard men were just giving up and throwing themselves off the top tier and killing themselves. Did it go through your mind as well? It's strange. When you witness someone else go through that horror of their twitching body laying there with blood coming out of their ears and you're only eight feet away because you were on the bottom tier, it's not the same. You start to question what it is that I have to do not to be him. Who do I turn to? Do I get on my knees and pray? Will prayers answer this? What do I find within me that saves me from being so weak? I capitulate like him and I give up my life. And then you come to the next stage when the violence is aimed at you and you survive. And there's no recompense there's no one to comfort you there's no one to blame and there's no one going to give you justice do you it's, feel scared nick in them scenarios no it's deeper than that it's when you're lured into this world of ultra violence where everything is chaotically normal 
where you find yourself wishing that you have the ability to mentally hold on, no matter what it is. I watched 11 people commit suicide. I was in a riot in which the buildings were on fire and the guards ran off laughing at us and left us there to die. I've been attacked multiple times for what I wasn't. In the end, the worst feeling was, I forgot who I looked like because I didn't have a mirror and I was ill with a terminal illness and I had to humiliatingly beg to die. But I never felt like jumping off the tier because I owed it to myself to see this out, even if I was going to force them to kill me. And you promised your mom, didn't you? Yeah. I think that's the thing as well. When it comes down to who you are in life, it's the promises you've made. You must be an empty, hollow person if you make cheap power promises all day. But the promises that I made, I gave away everything I own and I came back to the United Kingdom to be with my wife and children. And no matter what it takes, I'm going to get that done. Meanwhile, I've made promises to friends of mine who have cancer to make a documentary about them. I made promises to students that I'm coming there to speak at their school because they got suicide all throughout the school systems here. I've made promises that make me the baddest motherfucker on this planet because I believe in me. How did you fare against the the true base of the system? It doesn't affect you if you have an inner fortitude. No matter what system, you're always going to have the negative. But I mean in terms of because ultimately you aren't a beast. You're, you're an innocent man in doesn't. a system with the worst of the worst. You're Who, using a wrong analogy. It doesn't matter. Does it not? That's a weakness. Being but in instantly, it. what I'm saying is, Nick, so for me, if, if someone I, said I, I was in that scenario, right, obviously it would be me worse. I mean, I've had nightmares about shit like that. Because you've been in there, and, and I know you've, you've, you know, you've, um, you've been neighbors with some of the worst celebrity. What? Not even. What's the word for it? Like a horrific, people. horrific people in the world, which are now notorious for the, there you go, you know, the crimes that they've done. That isn't normal for an innocent man. How the fuck do you settle into that environment and be like, yeah, I've got a guy who's killed thirty people next door, but it's, I have to speak to him? Or do you just be like, no, I'm innocent. Fuck you all. I'm, I'm not actually like you. so glad that you asked me this because I'm going to try and explain this this way. You keep looking at the actual. You can't appreciate the perspective mentally of being in there. So it's not how can you be around that situation. You're physically there no matter what. It's how can you mentally not be affected by being around so much evil? And that's what it is. Twisted anger is evil. It's an energy that I felt. When I watched the real Buffalo Bill be executed and he walked past my cell and I felt his evil energy be push me backwards. Fucking hell, man. It's this. It's who you become in the course of a journey of two decades of being in this situation. Mm -hmm. It's not one scenario. It changed. It morphed. It was. It changed. It morphed. It was. Yeah, I, I went that. through so many journeys. I started out in a prison that was built in 1800s and finished in a brand new supermax. By the time I finished my time, I went from being the second youngest person sentenced to death row to one of the older ones. And the new ones were averaging 21 years of age when they were coming to death row. Fucking hell, man. That's what I mean. Do, you, does, do them things go through your mind like if this is going to be my, my way? I I know it sounds a bit again. Are you thinking about last meal? Are you think or do they like? I know that's like sounds like a simple question to ask, but it became like a it became like a thing as an between. You're partially friend. right. Yeah, I yeah. only thought about one thing, and this is what makes me the finest speaker in the world. I had two minutes or more, maybe three, to eloquently forgive them and speak beautifully about my life. That's it. 
So my mission was to take every distraction away from me, put a picture of myself on the wall, and begin to eloquently speak to myself so that I hoped and I prayed that on the day that they strapped me down and electrocuted me or stuck drugs in my veins, I could beautifully speak about who I am, forgive them for what they did, and then state what my beliefs were as beautifully as I can. You get it? Yeah. That was my drive. Yeah. I had one mission. I ain't going to make it out of here. I messed up my appeals after the escape. They were destroying the evidence. I ain't getting out of here. But the one thing that I know I'm going to do is when they execute me, I'm not going to embarrass myself by speaking like some broken kid from Southwest Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. You're almost proving yourself, regardless of their taking your life, you're proving yourself who you were as a man. I don't care what your circumstances are, you can still give yourself a goal. And is that how you got by in that, giving yourself those goals, whether it be reading the books, whether it be, do you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, so you have to give yourself drive. Because when you say it's not about the actual, and you know, maybe the way I asked the question was wrong, but I, I want to talk about the actual as well, though, because I think that, yes, I understand you're in there and there's no, you, there's no fucking way you're getting out. Um, you know, when you are approached by or speaking to a Buffalo Bill or who, whichever psychopath is in or, or whichever, whichever crime, you know, whoever's committed the crime, how do you deal with that person in that moment? Is it still a hatred? Do we, you're, I'm not like you, you're a fucking sicko. Or is it like, we're all in here together regardless? Because in your mind, how do you know they did what they did? Because Worst, you're innocent to you, Nick, but uh, they yeah, could be innocent that, to them. That's the complex nature of it all, isn't it? I've had brilliant friendships. I had open, amazing bonds with men who had done murder. I didn't see it. I only knew the person before me and I was giving them the respect of who they were treating me as yeah. right then and there. And I've dealt with people who have killed as many as 10 people, but they held so much self-respect. They were gang members. They weren't out killing children Innocent. and stuff. Yeah, right. yeah, of course. So I'm talking about the leaders of gangs that could have you and your family wiped out, you in the prison and them outside. So it's a complex world where... Not all killers are equal. Do you understand that? Yeah, of course. It's a complex word. And that's the practical reality of what you're dealing with. Because Baumgartner was a white man who went through Pittsburgh and shot a back, bunch of black people. He couldn't come out of his cell without getting punched in the face. Was it because it was predominantly black? Yeah. Prisons in America are yeah, predominantly yeah. black. And if you attack the black community, they have family members in the jails and they're going to send the word. You get it? Mm -hmm. Whereas little Nicky Scarfo had food being delivered to him. He was the head of the Italian mafia from South Philly. So I watched him get women and everything in the county jail hooked up. Crazy, that not that? Yeah, man. It's I've been around, man. Can I, you can you remember your first fight or your first altercation in that? Oh, yeah. What was that like? So my first fight was they finally opened the door after I had endured a day of attacks. And one of the biggest antagonists of the thing was a block worker. Uh, Fuddy was his name. And I just immediately came out covered with powder and everything. Like, it was horrible what they were doing to me. And I just lit him up. So the crazy thing is I was put into the juvenile system for being a violent offender. And I was trained by the Joe Frazier boxing instructors in my gymnasium in the forensic um, lockdown unit for juveniles. Fuck no. So by the time I got out of juvenile at six foot two, 210 pounds, I can knock most people out. I was a trained boxer. So that was a great skill, but it wasn't until I was on death row that I had to learn all these MMA tactics because they were making me fight against other prisoners just for sport. When people attacked you for thinking you were a sexual predator, etc., did I you had no ever, mercy on them? Did you ever have to justify yourself to them? Or I was it no about mercy, justifying it to, to me, you? I have no mercy on any attack on me. No. You don't get to, to explain to me anything and you're not going to be dealt with kindly. Yeah. Instantly. I'm sorry, man. Look, there was a bounty on me. And plus, people were thinking I'm a psychosexual predator. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, fucking hell, mate. I can't. 
the guards always loved to pick me out and fight because I was big and strong. So I had to go in and cage a lot to fight other prisoners while the guards bet $50 on me or $50 on the other guy. Man, I know, I know you were innocent. Did you ever fear coming out? No. Was that just, it was all you wanted? I had a duty. Did you ever feel this, did you always feel the same from sentenced up until you release? No. So was there parts of your way you thought, you know what, but maybe I just get the fucking chair and get it out the way? Or was that, was it like, I am innocent, I will do what it takes to get out of this this system? Because obviously you've, you've been in a escape. It changes. Yeah. I, if you can ask me that question right after I've escaped and I've ruined all my appeals and I'm sitting there with the death penalty plus 100 years, I don't know what my mindset is about it, but I just started to live. I know this one thing about me. I just realized it doesn't matter where I am or what I have. I'm going to live every moment of my life. There's a beautiful saying that the Native Americans say that upon your birth, you're only given so many heartbeats. Yeah. Dare not waste them in anger. I love that. I do. So ever since I learned how to stop being hateful with my heartbeats, everything changed. I was reading The Prophet by Khalil Gibran one Christmas Eve. Every year for 20 years, I read this book as a treat to myself because while he wrote the book, he lost most of the members of his family to tuberculosis. The power of this beautiful short book just made me feel so alive so that I realized if I could be alive on death row, I can live anywhere. I was married for nine years to a woman I only held for 15 minutes of my life. How does that work? How do you form that relationship when you're stuck in there forever? She met me and I wouldn't complain. They were taking interviews of all the other prisoners to try and get this hellhole shut down of a prison. And I didn't complain. And it befuddled her. Why wouldn't I complain? I didn't have any complaints. I was living. I was reading all the world's religions. And then she comes along. And then I get a newspaper. And then all of a sudden I learn about DNA. And I'm the first guy in America to ask for DNA from death row. And she's on television fighting for me and we're married in handcuffs at a ceremony and i believe in it all and then one year five years seven years nine years it's all gone by and then the evidence gets lost and then she leaves me and i'm wondering what to do so i cut my head leave you because you think you're stuck there forever now that's your last chance yeah all the evidence how is do gone. you deal with that because the one i thanked her the, the i thanked her hey man when someone leaves your life thank them for being in it to start with why weren't you so, uh, when you really felt good with that love and that gracious gifts of all of who they were, you never once were ever going to find yourself saying, Argh! but you did. That's horrible. I, I, want, I don't want to do that. And I didn't want to do that to somebody so precious who came to visit me every month for nine years. Yeah, that's it phenomenal. wasn't fair to them. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Lot. She wanted to go be free. Did it give so you what, hope as well? Yeah, no, what it did was it taught me a beautiful mes a message about love. Yeah. N love is the most fought after thing, and yet it's owned by no one. Fuck, he's following them today, aren't you, Nick? It's true. Yeah, it is. It's it not is. owned by anyone. It's given freely all the time. But even the person that's giving it is no longer in ownership of it, right? It's mad to think you can be in that scenario in your life and almost like your future's not, it's non-existent and you can still find a place to love. Obviously, I know that your laughter got you through it as well and, and things like that as well. I mean, for me, and it puts things into perspective because it just shows how much of a, a bitch people can be. So for instance, if I, if I have an ailment or an illness that I'm going through at the particular time or I'm waiting for a doctor's letter back or something like that, I'll feel fucking down f until I get that letter. And it could be a chest x-ray and it could be I've got the fucking flu. When you are when you know your, your fate is someone is going to strap you to a chair and kill you, how the fuck do you have it in you to laugh at any point? Like, that's what blows me you, mind about people like you. You have to live. Not only did I laugh, is it, is it not I a, laughed, a I loved, or? I opened up my heart to art. I explored who I was and everyone. Want to know why? 
because until the day that they put me to death, I was going to live. Yeah. What's the point in fucking not? Yeah, exactly. Why drag yourself in misery to the last moment when you can walk in splendor? Why not be a man? Why not be a woman? Why not face life with the full vigor that we are dying anyway? The most fascinating thing to me about this all is every time I sit down across the microphone and I talk to someone, they're living under a death sentence under the same thing that I am living under right now. Neither one of us has an appeal process. We don't even know the moment we're going to die. There's no way to fight this. We're going to have to keep living. Because we're going to die anyway. Eventually. Thank you. Yeah. That's I figured this out. I'm dealing with something called chronic traumatic encephalitis of the brain. I've been hit so many times in the face and head and, and attacks from behind. I'm dealing with something that's going to really challenge me in the next couple of years where invariably people with this disease kill themselves or kill many others or they become so deteriorated you can see the effects of it already on Mike Tyson yeah, yeah. CTE is, is real same? okay all right I'm going to be the first person ever to live with this long term without cognitive diminishment I am going to push myself to keep developing my brain until I am super fluid and I keep going I'm not going to lose do you know what I think's mad about that so some might say you were kind of predisposed to get that, whether you could have been in fights outside and boxing or whatever it is. And because you've been in there, it's enabled you to read that many books, to keep that brain active, to keep that. It, it, it's fucking mad, isn't it? Like, although you've served the worst scenario in your life, it could have been the most servant time of your life to prolong. Like, you, for all you know, you, you may have been dead at 60 without prison. You're all, going to live till 85 with prison. Do you as, get what I, I'm saying? as I sit here before you, all my childhood friends and both my brothers are dead. Exactly. Fucking how mad's that? God saved my life by putting me on death row. And he sealed it with a load of... I, 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 I can't make this up. It's the Marley moment, it's called. Bob Marley brought both factions of the war sides in Jamaica together in stage. And he asked him to shake hands and promised that there would be no more war. He stood back, he jumped in the air, he yelled, yeah, man, and he clapped. As he did, a bolt of lightning struck above his head. Ever since I saw that documentary about his life, where that moment happened. It's like the church, isn't it? The, like the courthouse. The courthouse, sorry, in the bolt. Ever since this happened, I realize I've been given a gift. Just tune into it. The only thing I have to do from here on to win is be a, a very nice person. Yeah. Hurt no one and be a nice person, and I win now. I got my wife back. I'm rebuilding my life here in England. I'm doing all this amazing work to help people, and within only two months, I've reached over a hundred million people so far with my positive message. It you pro and you probably, I mean, you, you to some degree, you'll be aware, but you probably don't even understand the capacity of how many lives you're actually you're saving wrong. right now. I do. Do know. you understand? I do understand because I get messages every day on Instagram telling me again and again. But what I'm saying is, for instance, them are the people who you know about. So if I didn't contact you, you'd already impacted me. I already do the 1%. Do you know what I mean? I've learned to do the 1%. If I'm hearing 1%, then I'm hearing 1% of something greater. Just kind of extrapolate. I don't need to year. know the exact number, but it's got to be something greater than the 1% of is, I'm hearing. And it's something greater than Nick Yaris. That's what it? I'm talking about. If my message of hope, development, and resilient caring for yourself holds true for others, then everything I went for was pennies on the table. Nick, when you're, when you're, in, when you're locked up, what kind of conversations do you have to get by with... With, um, it wouldn't be cellmates, but neighbor and, and people who are also in the system. I've had, is it, is it, I've had quantum physics conversations with geniuses on death row. Don't get the misnomer that because someone's killed that they're diminished. No, I think I'm the, I think the opposite. There are some actually. very clever people on I mean, death row. I mean, someone like you. 
I had an incident where I played a gentleman in chess for three years and I never beat him once. I got a draw off him at their 65 games and I jumped up on my bars and I facetiously started boasting, nobody beats Nick Yarris 66 times in a row. Beat my ass 65, I don't care, but nobody, and I mean this everyone, <laughs> nobody beats. <laughs> so he turned to me and said, come on tough boy, get back on the board. He spoke seven languages. And he who could, was he? He was a Vietnamese guy that went to death row, man, for working with the triads. And he was brilliant and he was super bright. And he beat my ass in chess for three years straight and I couldn't beat him. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of meeting someone so clever they could tell you the date of the week uh, uh, and any date in history and tell you what day of the week it was. Fucking crazy. Spoke yeah. seven languages, man. But misfortune struck and he went to death row because six people died in a house in Philadelphia, do including you children. Do you, do you find that people in there on death row, do you feel like they seek remorse or they wish they didn't do, do it because they've been faced with that? When you come face to face with your mortality, you seek within. What you seek within is either room humble forgiveness and prayers before God or an ignorant shallow ego that tells you you don't deserve this and you're, you're going to come up out of there and all that nasty. There's two versions of it. Yeah, of course. One is the man seeking forgiveness like a friend of mine, Keith Zettelmeyer, who was executed, who asked to be executed because he couldn't suffer no more. The other one was a man named Gary who saw his glory in being ex executed, only to find out that was a hollow treat. So I've seen both sides of the story from death row, and I've seen it again play out in life. I've had the most horrific experiences out here. And everything from a Sid's death, to loss of everything, to broken relationships, to feelings that most people would need to kill themselves over, that I'm fighting because I have a brain injury and they're not mine. I'm even fighting that because I believe so much in good that what my mother has said was true. Oh, Nikki, she'd say to me, I don't ask God for anything. I just pray for good. Yeah. What was the worst thing you've saw? Overall in life? When you were inside there? Uh, it was the murder of a young kid who got stabbed in the head with a screwdriver and I came upon him in his last moments of life and he asked me if he was going to be okay and I said yes. And it haunted me. Fuck no. I know. I didn't know what else to say. When was, did you find out he died? No, he flopped over and died. Oh, right. right. He actually died there. Yeah, he had a screwdriver him. stuck in the top fucking of his hell. fucking head, man. Somebody went in his cell and stabbed him with a screwdriver. So that one, that was pretty bad. And the other thing was I was forced to beat a man and I ended up really hurting him badly. And it just, for years, I couldn't stop feeling horrible about that because he only, he was like five foot three, five foot five, eight stone. Why'd you beat him? I'm in the cage with him, man, and there's four guards standing there with sticks, and if I don't fight, they're going to beat me, all four of them. So is that what happens? They tell you to beat someone or they're going to beat you? Yeah, so this little black dude spit in the guard's face, so the guard put him in the cage against me to punish him. It's almost like they're making you that animal, though, isn't it? By doing that, like, we'll stick him in with a lion. You're a fucking innocent We're going to be executed. Who do they? They never saw they were going to see me again. I'm going to be executed. Play with them. They're How dead. close did you get, Nick, to it's being executed? Probably like 60 to 90 days. Oh, fucking hell, man. Did uh, anything change in your thoughts then or not? Nope. All I wanted to do was find meaning. Why would you send me on this journey, God? What am I supposed to find? Who am I supposed to meet? That's the way I do it. Did you think about the chair? Did, you, did that ever go through your head? How it's going to happen and how you're going to fail? And Only to the point that I needed to get my shit together to have my speech ready. Okay. Look, they, they won. I ruined my appeals. They, they confirmed my appeals. This was before DNA. They used to come to my 
to my cell and bring me out every month and ask me to give up my appeals and admit that I killed Mrs. Craig and then finally fill out this stupid ass form of telling them what to do with my body. And I refuse to tell them every month what to do with my body. That was what I went through. Fucking hell. Do you, uh, do you ever get to meet the person who would have done it? No. No, is that just someone? Random. I wasn't worried about all that. Look, I would rather take control and steer directly into the curve than fight against and resist what I know is coming. So I just flung myself into living. And when I was so sick with hepatitis C, I thought I was dying. I asked to be executed. And it got me my freedom because once again, God's been guiding my whole journey. It isn't until I fully surrendered that God saved my life and gave me the DNA results that set me free. Within 10 months of my release, I was here in England addressing a combined session of the lower house of commons and Kofi Annan, the UN secretary general at the time, told me right then I was the finest speaker he'd ever heard in his life. I was 10 months out of death row, man. Fucking hell, man. I believe in myself because I witnessed people try their best to make me ugly and evil. And I mean evil. And I watched people stab me and look at me as if I was the devil while they themselves were evil. I watched people mock me spit in my food and do horrible things to me thinking that they were punishing me when they were actually torturing me for something I didn't do. That's the bit. It's that bit. Do you know what I mean? Like I understand the, well, I don't understand, but the torture, the fucking, you've been shot as well. I've been shot as well. As a younger person. Yeah. So I've been through everything. So you've been, you've been through all the things that, you know, I've, fucking, I've never been through anything like that. Um, you know, I've seen, a, you know, you see a bit of hardship or you, you, you skint at times or business not going well and you think it's the end, or you go through a bad breakup or something like that and you think it's the end of the world. I can't even imagine being locked in a cage for something you didn't do and, and go through all that type of stuff. Um, it's, it's I, I kind of get over it. I know it sounds mad, but like for me to be sitting across the table to you to know and yet that. you're doing it right now. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You're doing it to yourself right now. You're, you're, you're failing to miss the point. You're living out a crime right now of being born. You're living under a death sentence right now. Mm. That's what I was doing. Yeah, that's it. I was born at the wrong time and I got thrown in a cell with two other million people. So don't take it personal get it <laughs> fucking hell how can you be that it's mad though do you know what i mean it is in a way but it's actually conceptually beautiful that since the day that i walked out of that prison i've not had to have one psychiatric counseling session man because i worked that hard at understanding we have to live no matter what our circumstance ask a person in a wheelchair what it feels like to hug someone and they'll cry because they haven't done it in a while but they're living they're alive. I think you you are a true example of a, like, like that's what we're here for. We're supposed to survive. Do you know what I mean? I think Grow. that's, yeah. And survive and adapt and change and, and kind of, and you've did that to the fullest. Close your eyes for a minute. A hundred years before you were born, those people that genetically brought you your life fought through famine, war, tyranny, loss, hunger, all of these things that drove them and they gave you your life. Can you get it now? Yeah. I'm not the only part of me. I am my grandfather An from extension. England. I'm my grandmother from Irish. I'm my grandfather from Russia. I'm my grandmother from Ukraine. I am my great great parents. I'm the representation of all their strife and struggles to pass on what they were as best that they could. How dare I spit in her face now? Hmm. I can't do that. And I only learned this because they were trying to murder me. And when someone's trying to take everything my generations fought for, I had to yield up to nothing and then face all of this fiercely like a man and then step forward and say, my people were right to live. 
the people who fought through this plague and survived this war were right to give me my chance because I'm going to rock this for them who cried in the fields of hunger or whatever. I got to represent my people. I got to be this man. Yeah. If you doubt yourself, you spit in the graves of the people who brought you your life. And if you doubt yourself, I suppose you've already lost as well, haven't you? I'm it's never going to doubt myself because I know I already told you all my plans and are already coming true. I told people when I left America, I was giving everything away. I wasn't trying to sell it. I gave my RV to a family that had an autistic child. I gave my car away. I gave my possessions away. I gave everything away because I was going to renew it. And the only way I could let go of all of that harsh struggle that I went through was to free myself in every possible way, and I did it. Nick, the, the moment you were giving your freedom back, can you remember that, that moment? Can you actually remember the moment it happened? That what I was, was that walking like? out, you yeah. mean? Yeah, so they botched my release earlier that day, and it was a little bit traumatic. They drove me up to the gates in the van and then blew it took me back but when i finally walked out it i was suave i rolled up to the microphones of the assembled press and i didn't start blubbering or outlandishly screaming at them for what they did i told them i was cold because like i was asked how do you feel i said i'm cold and they said, what do you have to say? I said, there are two men in the prison behind me that are innocent. And I need someone to come and help them. Thank you. And I walked away. Fucking hell, man. Dropped the mic. And I got both of them men out of prison. Ernie Simmons and Walter Ogrod are both free, thanks to me. How were the the screws, if you like? How were the prison guards? And it changed. Were, when, when you got that release date or whatever, were they like... Yeah, but that's a time stamp. They're changed. Um, so when I went to prison, they were men who went through experiences in life. When I was leaving, they were all young kids coming right out of the military. It all changes. What about your, um, you know, your other people in cells, the people who you shared time with, years? You've, you've built relationships for 20 years, mate. How were they when you told them you were leaving? Were they, were they envious because they were gonna, their lives were gone? They no. were actually gonna get murdered? It, no, it's weird. A, lot, a few of them went on hunger strike in protest to the treatment I was receiving at the end. And they were heartbroken that I was being tortured when I wasn't like them. Yeah. And that's sad, man. But you think about it. Here's men who have actually butchered others and they're starving themselves in protest for what's being done to a man who spent all that time next to him for something they did and he didn't. Fucking crazy that to show that even the the most horrific people have got that empathy for you. Do you know what I mean? I think that's what's hard to get your head around as well. But If I was writing letters to your mom because you couldn't write to her, how would you feel when I had to leave? Yeah, exactly. You've been their saviour, haven't you, as well? That I used like... to catch all the young ones coming into death row angry and tell them all the things that I needed to tell them to help them survive. I wasn't there to judge. I wasn't there to punish. I actually tried to help them. What kind of advice were you giving these young people who were coming into the system? Get into the school system. Get as many books as you can. Try and occupy your brain. Stop blaming yourself. It's over. Shut the door and learn. So you would tell them it's over, not yeah. to just stop trying to make kick, peace with that. Stop trying to open the door. Shut the door. Shut the door and learn. Stop fighting the door. The door is not your enemy. Why would you tell someone to stop fighting when you fought as much as you did? No, you misunderstood. Stop fighting the door. Stop fighting this need to, you got to get out of here to prove your, you know, like, because a lot of yeah, them, yeah, they're yeah, all yeah. good. Stop being that macho. Stop fighting the door. Start learning. The more you learn while you're in the cell, the longer your chances are of survival. Because you've been an innocent man all, all your life, can you tell when someone's guilty? You know, when they come into the system, can you tell, regardless what they're fighting, what they're oh, saying? I mean, the dead eyes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's times when you can meet people who have given up being in touch with their soul. They call it soulless, and their eyes are dead. And they're help. just, yeah, I've, I've, I've met them. I had one try to kill me for a couple of months, really sincerely. How? Like, what, what was he trying to do? 
Killed he, you, as in trying to poison you physically? No, no, no. Time. He wanted, he was desperately trying to get me to come into the cage with him so he could kill me in Florida. Why did, why did they want to kill he you? He saw me as a trophy. He was only 5'5", oh, okay. five, five, but he was a martial arts expert that already killed seven people. So he wanted me to be the baddest trophy of them all. That was it. It was just a challenge. No hate. Fucking hell. Do you see much of that inside them places? Do you see people getting stabbed? Or, because obviously you're- Depends on the you're prison. Kind of solitary, ain't you? Like, yeah, so there's a lot of it that changes. It, the level of prison. If you go into a level five prison in America, you're more likely to get stabbed on a monthly basis than you are in a level two. Yeah. So a different sliding scale. Whereas if you're on death row, there's probably less violence, but if there is a it's Yeah, like I said, much. I I was in a prison that was so violent it erupted in a riot in nineteen eighty nine and they took control of the prison briefly. Yeah. When they are so fed up with the abuse that the prisoners overtake the prison, that gives you a clue how bad it was. Do you when you got out, Nick, did you feel any kind of like the public are going to see me as this beast anywhere. Nope. Because you knew in your heart. Nope. I was on a mission. I only had a three year window to live when I first got out because my liver was so damaged. So I thought I'd have to be on a liver transplant. Then I got my miracle gift of getting my health back and I started launching a speaking tour in Europe. So I only was in Philadelphia briefly a couple of months when I first got out and then I left and started my life over because I knew I was not the person I physically was. Yeah. Weird. Inside, I was walking around with genius level auditory skills with language skills off the charts as well. And I had talent to the point that Within 10 months of my release, I was in Rome at the Colosseum with 20,000 people in attendance and me on stage in a black suit. It's not mad. It's not. Where you've you've come, though, man. That's what I'm talking about. When someone tortures you, you believe in yourself. When someone teaches you that they're going to determinedly break you and ruin your life, that's where you start to believe in yourself. In this room right now, and again, I know people can't see it when they're watching or listening, you ooze with confidence, like fucking, you don't, I get it. Like a lot of people said about me, to be honest, but I know, I feel that you kind of pick up an energy. Da, da, da. With you, it's like, a, I am who I say I am. And it's because of this. And it's not even a delusion. It's like a no, no. Do you get what I mean? It comes down to this. You ready? Do you believe in God? Yeah. Then why do you have fear? Yeah. It's simple. If you really, you really believe that you're this gift that God created, like the rest of us and all of this, that you really believe that, then why be afraid? Did you always believe in God? I cursed God at first. I was so Why did you do this to me and all that? Then I watched the first man kill himself. And then I got stabbed and I almost died. And then I was being tortured and beaten and tortured and beaten. And finally I started to thank God. Thank you for not letting me be them. Thank, I get your lesson now. I was so vulgar, I was so ugly, I was so brusque, I was so mean. I used to love punching people and beating people up. I used to be evil. God gave me a gift to give me a way back. I at first was angry for this huge gift and then I didn't understand this beautiful gift. My suffering became my cleansing. My cleansing became my healing. My healing became my development. I walked out of death row feeling Like I had accomplished what God asked of me. Not angry at what I'd gone through. Not resenting what my family was put through. Not seeking vengeance for what was done to me. I was grateful. God taught me a unique thing that I could be a child again. Because when I first got out, the first time I walked on grass and bare feet, I wept. It was on my little brother's grave. The first time that I tasted ice cream, 
I was in blankets, wrapped up in my bedroom, looking out at the full moon. I'd finally seen the moon after two Fucking decades, hell, man. man. You seen yourself as well? That was a shocker. I didn't have a mirror for 20-some years, man. So. Fucking hell. Imagine not knowing what you look like. Who cares? That, Blind know, people aren't freaked out. <laughs> you fucking, mate, your, your mentality is something else, like. I it's had something to else, learn. Man. Do you stay in touch with anyone? From death row? Just in general, yeah, yeah. People the last guy, the last one I was in touch with, I just got him out of death row. Water, I got water. Um, but now I'm done. Um, I, I have to, I have to go off with this mission of neuroplasticity healing now. Can I ask? Do you, you know, when you've did the, when you've got people off death row and stuff like that, do you, is your plan to fully exonerate them, or is it to just get them off death row? Like, even if they are guilty, do no, you not believe in death row? No, or do you, I is, met two men in prison who asked me to help them and I got them out of prison. That was my duty and my thank you back to God for giving me this beautiful, amazing education and a purpose in life. I've saved thousands of people from killing themselves already. Of course, yeah. I've gotten thousands of people to stop being violent, getting off of drugs. I'm blessed beyond reason. So I had to pay a toll to get this gift. Isn't that badass? Yeah, I can own it now. I paid all my tolls. You're a legend, mate. You're a Thanks. legend. I want to I wanna ask you one more thing about that before, before I kind of go where I'm going with it. Um, with the people that you've met along the way, inside and outside, who would you say is the most notorious type of fella you've met? Is there any one where like, yeah, you'll know who this guy is or this guy, or do you know what I mean? Because you'll find a lot of people regardless, and I believe it's, it's completely wrong. I mean, I've had a, I had a detective who led Scotland's um, police department and, you know, he said that a lot of killers and stuff, the, the glamorized and the, the, they're seen as trophies almost, no, but really no. we're all give, we're constantly giving them the identity. I think Gino Sproul was a badass. So this guy from Pittsburgh killed 10 mob mobsters. He was a hit man. Did you meet him? He was my buddy. He used to stand in his cell and just punch the wall all day because he had a callus on his fist that was almost a foot, uh, an inch in, in thick diameter. And Gino just loved me. He just, he liked me. My personality, I used to make him laugh. I used to torment him. So I, I, uh, I used to call him uh, SpaghettiOs. And that's because he was half Italian and half black. And yeah. he got recruited by his half Italian mob bob dad to become a killer. But he was one of the most notorious killers in Pennsylvania, man. They had to fly him out of one prison by helicopter because of all the mayhem he was causing. So many inmates were trying to get to him to kill him because he was robbing everybody and beating everybody. He didn't care if you were the leader of a gang. He just roughed you. He was 6'6", 250. And he was That's just a unit. Yeah. He was just one eyebrow and no nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> That's quality that mate. That's quality that. Hey, I really adds I, I'm really amazed that once again, despite everything that I've gone through, I've proven to myself again I'm lucid, sane, happy, and alive. That's you your gift to me today. Yeah? Yeah. The feeling that I get each time that I get a chance to sit down with someone is, what can I offer them? What is it about me that I, I can share with them that makes us identify in each other? We've done those two. Yeah. And the last one is this. I can offer you my love for bringing me here and giving me my chance to do this because you know my circumstances and you know how important it is for me to keep the hustle going. Keep winning, Matt. Yeah, man. I'm nailing this. So next week's a big, big blow up. So I know you've been on, obviously, Joe Rogan. You've been on a lot of the big, biggest podcasts in the world, uh, spreading the message, spreading the love, spreading the energy, only doing great things around the world. Um, what does the future look like for Nick Yaros? I'm launching my speaking tour, going around to schools and colleges and universities in this country because the rates of suicide in the United Kingdom are so high, it's time for me to launch that effort and help that. I can't see having this beautiful gift and squandering it by not touching young people's lives and getting them away from suicide. 
If I can yeah. make it to this point with the arduous task that I've taken upon life to make it to this point, they can do it too. Are you going to do it overseas in America as well? Uh, I really want to hang back from going back to America for a while. I'd love to do a European tour and mostly over here. But I, I'm, I'm kind of... Do you feel like you're done with that? Of the, All right. Is there a lot of negative feelings towards that area now? No. How, how about uh, this perspective? So many people have been proven innocent and released in America. It's blasé. Yeah. I am the only I am the only former death row prisoner in the United Kingdom, proven innocent by DNA walking around in this country. How does it work when you when you're released like from death row? Is it like cuz I'm assuming it wouldn't not that you've pursued it, but I'm assuming it wouldn't be the easiest thing to get a fucking job. Oh, actually it's it's weird. Um I had no qualifications, no CV or anything, so I came here to England and early 2005 and I began practicing speaking in Hyde Park Speaker's Corner. Brilliant. I was identified by a radio personality's wife, got onto his program and then ended up on Michael Burke's The Choice mm -hmm. and I launched my speaking career. Fucking amazing. So for the the students of the universities, for the people in the schools, the pupils, um, and anyone who comes to one of your talks, because I know, I already know you're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I mean, 100 million people, you're spreading the message you, and, it, and it's going to go bigger. You've been doing that. You've been in the UK two months. Um, what can people expect when they've had an experience with you? I don't know how to answer that. All I know is my job is to do what I did for you. Come in the room and be generally me. That's it. Because I, I just want to say this, and I think it's important for me to say it, because again, I, I feel like I'm a lucky um, man who's had the had the experience of sitting down with you. Not not many people around the world are ever going to have an experience like this. Um, I would love to come to your talks, regardless. I want to be there. I want to be part of it because I want to see that side of it. And, I, and I've had this one-to-one, -one which not every student would get. But I know certainly when I was at university or I was at school and, and I've seen suicide rounders and stuff like that, I would I would absolutely love for someone like yourself to be in there and help getting into the minds of these people. So if there's anywhere people can find you, social media, if they want to reach out to you, if they want to listen to your podcasts, where do they go, Nick? I have a brand new website called nyaris.com and Instagram. I only stick to one platform. I don't like to jump around. Um, and I also have a very close friend of mine named Simon who's um, seriously chronically ill, and I promised him I would never give up Instagram. So basically, I don't have a blue check. I'll never go professional. I'm just me. Okay. And I like the fact that I'm actually one of the few people out here that's literally living my own message as I spread it each day. I'm so surprised there isn't a film made on you. Oh, there is being one made. Is the one being made on you? Yeah, there you go. Oh, can I ask you, Nick? Right. Um, curiosity. Did you... Were you compensated for the years? No, I actually, I had to fight uh, a long uh, legal battle. I got paid uh, after the lawyers took a third of it. And then I got paid after the 1.9 exchange to the pound. So I didn't end up with $4 million like everybody believes. I ended up with 750,000 pounds. And that was 19 years ago almost. And that's fucking, yeah. that's absolutely fuck all. So you see what I mean? Everybody had two years of your life, man. Right. I don't like the fact that people equate my wealth with finances no. when I'm probably the richest man in the world. When I open my phone and I get a, f a message from someone telling me how I've I've gotten them to not kill themselves. And I think you're the richest man in the world by just being here after where could have went, mate. Look at all the people around you who I'm are no longer with us. not supposed to be here, Ads. Exactly, I was not mate. supposed to be here today. Do you, last question, do you feel, and I know it's been, what, 19 years since you've been released? Do you feel still appreciative every day? Like, do you still, like, look around and think, like, is any part of your mind institutionalized? Or are you, do you get what I'm saying? Or is it like... I don't know what's it like. You've been away. You've been away nearly. I mean, I'm 33. You've been. I was 10 year old when you went away. Do you know what I mean? Effectively. Yeah. So it's like, oh, man. I kind of. I always do this. Me and Laura, my wife, were driving along, and I looked up and I told her again, "Babe, every time I see the night sky, I get a thrill. I'm free. I couldn't see the night sky." 
I knew when it was daytime most of the time. But to see the stars, the dream. So for the rest of my life, and even at this point, whenever I look up and I can see the nighttime sky, I'm still alive. And I'm still able to have a dream. Nick, thank you so much for today, mate. It's a pleasure, mate. Thank you, Thank Ed. you, buddy. Thank you, mate. Yes, sir.